We've got lots of people on board. Welcome to you all. Um, welcome to everybody to our very first ARI seminar for 2021. Very exciting. We've got two speakers today. Both of them are relatively new ARI staff. Both joined us during lockdown last year, very weird for them. Hope you give them an extra warm welcome. Um, we've got Christina Renaud and, and Lily Van Eden, both um, exploring what is sort of um, new areas of research for ARI perhaps. If you joined our legacy seminars last year, you would have heard us talk about us aiming to increase our capability into behavioural science and nature connectedness and what we can do in some new spaces that we think are really important for us. So Christina and Lily will both be introducing us to some of this kind of work. I'm not going to tell you about their backgrounds because they do that partly in their own talks, but um, welcome. Christina is going to be first. We'll listen to Christina. We'll have a few questions and then we'll jump to Lily's and have questions for Lily at the end. And if you think at the end of a question that you would like to have asked Christina, I'm sure we can jump that in at the end as well. Put your questions in the chat in the little um, question and answer column and we'll get to them after we hear from Christina. Christina, thanks very much. Yes. Over to you. Thank you so much, Fern. Um, and hello to everybody. I'm really excited to be uh, giving my first ARI presentation and I started in October last year. Uh, but before I launch into my work at ARI, I'll give you a bit of background um, from myself and my research as well. Uh, before I do that, I would like to acknowledge the land of the Kulin Nations people where I live, work and connect country, and I pay my respects to their elders past, present and future, and welcome any, um, acknowledge any Aboriginal people with us here today. Okay, whoop, went too fast. So a very brief history of me. I did an undergraduate degree at Deakin University looking uh, studying conservation ecology and I did an undergraduate research project uh, with, which looked at the translocation and radio tracking of the endangered growling grass frog, that top left picture. And I did this with Jeff Hurd and Peter Robertson who you probably uh, many of you know quite well and that was a really great introduction to frogs and, and I grew a great love of frogs from that. Uh, I did an honours research year in frogs as well uh, looking at urban remnants in southeast Melbourne and their occurrences throughout those remnants. Pretty much straight from honours, I went into a consultancy role at Ecology Australia, was there for a little over eight years. And again, I got to work with grass grassfrogs, golden sun moss, lots of different um, threatened species, uh, particularly in the Melbourne urban growth corridors. From there though, I started to shift perspectives uh, after I had children and I was able to reflect on my own upbringing and how much time I spent in nature as a child. And that's me down in the left um, photo, I spent three years of my childhood uh, growing up in Vanuatu, so there was no TV. I came back and didn't even know who the Simpsons were, so it was quite a different um, upbringing to many kids. Um, but I felt I wanted this for my children as well. And perhaps other children and other families needed this sort of connection and contact with nature as well. So from here, I um, founded my own organisation called Leap Into Nature in 2014. And my key purpose here was really about nature connection for children. But when I started to read, there was quite a lot of information about this um, idea about nature deficit disorder, which was coined by Richard Louvre in 2005. And some of you might be familiar with the, this work um, from a book called Last Child in the Woods. And so what this was telling me was that, yes, I was definitely on the right track. There is a movement here that we're, uh, that's trying to get people and children especially uh, connected with nature. And from nature deficit disorder, there's kind of four main things uh, that are that are playing out. And it's this decrease in open spaces, uh, particularly in urbanized areas, a parental fear. So this idea of stranger danger and being scared of creepy crawlies. Um, and also what I was really wanting to focus on was this less appreciation of the natural world. And also just trying to get people, kids, sorry, off screens and outdoors and spending more time in nature. So why is nature connection important for children? So there are many, you know, physical benefits, health and well-being, mental health, social, physical and cognitive development as well for children. But my key interest was around this idea of um, direct experiences and also having positive role models because the research has shown that, that's, that this can um, lead to more children growing up and then taking action to benefit the environment as adults. And I definitely felt that in my life that my growing up in nature had led me to the roles that I do today. 
so as Leap Into Nature, we did lots and lots of different activities, um, lots of bird watching. Um, and I, I find this photo funny. It looks like we're looking at something really, really super exciting, but I think it was a magpie lark. But it's just sharing those joyful moments uh, and having contact with everyday nature that Leap Into Nature really was a part of. Uh, the other really key element was making discoveries with children, even if it was just a, a common little millipede or something, just to share my excitement about nature and get them enthusiastic about it as well. And the other great benefit was the parents getting involved and them sort of, you know, releasing their fears as well and, and getting really involved in it with, with their children and sharing those discoveries together. Then I sort of moved into sort of bigger community events, running Save the Frogs Days with Manningham City Council or Melbourne Water and also helping um, Melbourne Water uh, create awareness for their Frog Census app, the Citizen Science app. Uh, I also helped the City of Glen Ira develop their Citizen Science program, which is called Nature Next Door. And we focused on birds and insect pollinators a lot in that project. And hopefully they'll continue that on this year after COVID has rest restrictions have eased. So uh, after Leap Into Nature, well, during as well, I started to shift my practice again. I started to look at ways um, that I could incorporate what I'd done into a research project. And so I did this as part of my Master of Environment course at the University of Melbourne. And this research took place in 2019 under the supervision of Dr. Tanya Bear and Dr. Lewis Matter. So I'll talk to you now a little bit about this research. But first I'd like to pose this question that was sort of a bit of my inspiration for doing this research. So can art change the world? Well, I'm going to give you the answer. <laughs> Maybe not your answer, but an answer. Um, but sure, story, performance, poetry, music, art may not be able to take carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere, but it does have the potential to shift perspectives. And this quote, I think, sums it up that the arts, it has been said, cannot change the world, but they may change human beings who might change the world. So this was my sort of inspiration that using art to help people connect with nature is a really great and different way forward. Um, so what is nature connection? I think we talk about this quite a lot, but it's, I think we also need to talk about the disconnect. Um, so this idea that people have really lost their way and lost their connection and relationship with the natural world. And this is why we're seeing much of the ecological breakdown that we do uh, at the moment and, and we have for years. Um, we can look at definitions from caring for country, um, of which we have so much to learn from um, Aboriginal people. And to biophilia, this innate tendency to affiliate with life and lifelike processes, and right through to those ideas of multi-dimensional pathways of connecting to nature. But what really inspired me was this um, idea of kind of decentering humans. So where do we sit? How do we view ourselves? What is our worldview of nature and our connection to nature? Um, and for my research, I was quite inspired by this idea of breaking down binaries of people and nature, art and science, mind and body. Um, and so my research was relatively simple exploration of this idea, this knowing or awareness of our place within biodiversity, and particularly in an urban setting where we know this relationship has been deeply severed. And I did that through the lens of science communication and participatory arts inquiry. So my approach to this research was a little bit different to maybe what's been done before. A lot of people measure and quantify nature connection. Um, and by using quantitative methods, we're able to get um, more of a breadth and the ability to generalize across a population. Rather, I looked at this um, from a qualitative perspective, which provides depth and understanding and a nuanced way of knowing how people relate and connect to nature. I used my tacit knowledge and experience to create these um, workshops. And the, the workshops that I created were inspired by nature and used this integrated approach to art and science communication. So what is this art and science I'm talking about? Well, it's definitely nothing new. Um, indigenous cultures around the world uh, have always incorporated art and science in their ways of communicating knowledge. And I just wanted to share this quote that came um, from a book called Song Lines by Margot Neal and Lynn Kelly. And it says, country cannot speak for itself, so art must speak for country. And to me, that really sums up that beautiful connection between what art and science can tell us together. Some other inspiration for my work and my practice has been uh, other art science projects. So the one on the top right was the art and science of falling in love with Joshua trees. So this was around uh, the impact that climate change is having on Joshua trees and participants were asked to 
pr produce art and also write love letters to Joshua Trees to show um, their love and also their interest and understanding of the threats that Joshua Trees face. And the bottom picture was um, from Tanya Bear, my, one of my supervisors, and this was a participatory art, ecological artwork and it was called Refugium and it happened at Federation Square and a lot of participants came to create these moss balls or cockadamas, which had indigenous plants and they were hung up uh, on display and with little notes about their relationship with nature. So getting that tactile and, and that feeling of contribution, making something is something that I was really interested in. The other thing about art science is that can, it can enliven this idea of communication, of science communication. And we can move away from an information driven approach. So rather than me yelling sh facts and figures at people, this is a different way in, a different way to communicate that information. It's a transdisciplinary practice. So we're melding those forms of knowledge and we're moving into something new, something different. It's participatory and experiential. I really wanted people to have an experience within nature and to be able to communicate that experience through art. The most important thing I think about arts and, and bring that in with the sciences is that it can engage people's emotions or effective domain of learning. And this is really important because it's a way into people that we can, they can start to express themselves through the art rather than sort of being bogged down by facts and figures. And it makes the messages more relatable and more personal. And importantly, the arts have the ability to act as deep leverage points or lever this, this idea of prompting visceral and emotive responses and engaging in the imagination in ways that potentially inspire action and behavior change. So the study site I did my uh, work at was called the Living Pavilion. So this was a temporary uh, event that was set up at the University of Melbourne uh, in May 2019. It was an indigenous led transdisciplinary project and it had many elements um, as part of it. There was uh, indigenous culture and knowledge of the land and the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nations. So I'd also like to pay my respects to uh, the Wurundjeri people for where this research uh, took place. There was ecological science being displayed, a botanical exhibition, there was 40,000 uh, indigenous plants, Kulin Nation indigenous plants were brought onto the site. Um, so this, these plants um, represent what was there prior to colonisation. And so they were brought back uh, into the site and, and showed with all these beautiful signage and explains what the plants were used for uh, from Wurundjeri people. Um, and then the plants were, when the event was open, uh, over, sorry, they were taken into a revegetation project in Melbourne. A sustainable design was used, science communication and participatory and community arts. So just to run over my methods, I use the head, heart and hand transformative experience model. And this creates a multidimensional and sensorial sort of experience where we can elicit those uh, emotional and mindful responses to nature. It has its roots in ecological literacy and sustainable education, sustainability education. And we use this framework to structure the design of the workshops and our empirical investigation. Um, so as part of the design, I created three participatory art science workshops and I'll talk you through what they all involved. I also used uh, open ended questionnaires. So there were 20 people that came overall to the workshops and of them I interviewed, um, did semi structured qualitative interviews of six participants. So remember, we're looking at qualitative research, which is more about nuanced understanding. So it doesn't look at sort of hundreds of people. It looks at just a, a small set of people and their partic particular experiences. I also use photo and image elicitations so that we could look at the artworks that people had created and reflect back on their time during the, um, the workshops to, to dig deeper into their experience. And then I used a thematic analysis to analyze the data. So in qualitative data, that means you read, you reread the data, the questionnaires, the interviews, the artwork, and we're looking for sim similarities and differences between the responses. And eventually you come to themes or common ideas that become apparent and emerge from the data. Okay, so the art science workshops. The first one looked at frogs and I called it frog ensemble. And the sensory part of it was sound and the ecological component was frogs and I'll talk through the creative component as well as I go through each one. The biodiversity snapshot um, was the second one and this looked at insect pollinators and also used macro photography. 
The third one was called Ephemeral in Nature, and we focused on the Indigenous plants and the, and the botanical crafting activity. So each workshop had, first of all, an ecological presentation. So this is when I would talk about uh, frogs and perhaps the um, decline of frogs um, and the species extinctions and that sort of thing that's going on with frogs. And then for others, I would talk about how to identify certain insect species. So when they went out onto the site of the living pavilion, they could go and look for those uh, insects. And with the plants, I also talked about their interactions and habitat um, that they support for, for species. Then we did an ecological activity. So up the top left, the, we did a um, walk of the frog soundscape, which was designed by Dr. Kirsten Paris at the University of Melbourne. And these were sort of hidden speakers within all the vegetation in this sort of creek line area. And so I was able to teach uh, people how to identify the unique calls of frogs. And so we had that sort of listening time throughout, throughout that activity. Uh, the second one down the bottom was they went out, this was for the biodiversity snapshot, and they went and did some insect observations, sort of like a, a mini citizen science activity and recorded what they found. And then the top right is um, basically like a tour that we did of the living pavilion and getting down and dirty with the plants and having a touch and a feel and a smell and getting to understand the different species that were on site. And then the last part was this creative inquiry. So up the top left was the frog ensemble and they were given a range of materials to use to create any art they wanted. Some did poetry, some did painting. Um, this particular participant was us using mud and, and was getting really creative in that sense. Um, the one on the right, they're doing macro photography. So I gave each person a little macro clip on lens for their iPhone and they were able to take some macro shots of um, insects and flowers. And then the bottom left is this idea of botanical crafting, um, which, which is a way, a different way to interact with uh, vegetation and a way to reignite our relationship with the more than human. Okay, so from, from the workshops and the analysis, I came up with um, three emerging themes. The first one was discovery. So this really speaks to our head learning. The second was flow, uh, which speaks to sort of deep engagement, active use of hands. <laughs> and I'll talk about these in a bit more detail. And then attunement was, was what speaks to our heart. So I'll just go through one example of each. I had many, many quotes, but um, due to time, I'll just, I'll just whiz you through an example of each one. So the first point was, um, when I asked people about what they learned, did they learn something new? 85% of participants said they learned something new from the workshops. And this particular theme was about discovery or the thrill of discovery. And it has been shown in other studies as well that this idea of a rediscovery or discovery of common garden species can be equally exciting for people um, as it can observing rare species, for example. So this particular participant learned about the skipper butterfly and she said, um, the skipper butterfly was ob obviously around me all the time that I hadn't paid attention to. So I felt a sense of a thrill of seeing a new animal and a thrill of having learned something new. So connecting to nature through that understanding and, and learning something new was an important finding. Then this idea of flow. So flow had been coined many years ago by Mahali Mahali, I'm sorry, I'm not really good at saying his name. Um, and this was mostly seen through the botanical crafting activity. There was a real sense that they were enjoying the experience. And flow is this idea of highly focused mental state, and it increases our awareness and we feel feelings of connection and well-being. And the sorts of words that people were using were motivated, reflective, connected, having fun, immersed and empowered. It's this idea that we lose track of time. We are in the zone and we're feeling really part of it and um, really enjoying the activity. And this particular um, quote was from one of the participants and she said, I stopped thinking about it had to be a perfect masterpiece. It was just an expression of whatever you wanted it to be. It was the process that made it. So this example shows us that it, the process is more important than the outcome. And, and this is where people get to feel those experiences of flow. Um, and the good thing about flow is that because it gives you such good feelings, people want to come and do these sorts of activities again. And the last theme was attunement. So this idea I got from just sort of this idea of ecological awareness, being in tune with nature. Um, and it, it just it's almost this ecological mindfulness as well, this deeper understanding of our sort of underlying connectedness of all things. 
Um, Timothy Morton calls it an ecological intimacy between humans and non-humans. And this tuning into nature has also been found by other researchers as well. And this particular quote says, my mind was more attuned to the messiness of nature and became more open-minded so that moments of creativity made me feel connected to my surroundings and my alertness and awareness. So just to recap on a couple of the benefits that I found that um, these participatory art science experiences created for people with some of the quotes that they shared with me, that they felt that the art activity gave time to reflect, process and respond with joy and connection. That art gave space to consider what they had learned. And the experience was deeper as they were able to include their subjective and creative view and they felt more personally involved, which often you can't get with just, you know, numbers and figures and graphs being thrown at you. So having that visceral emotive um, experience was really important. And so just in summary, the head, heart and hand, um, pulling that together from the transformative experience. So it's the head is the discovery that cognitive learning, the knowledge, understanding and expanding our perceptions. The hand flow, so getting deeply engaged, enjoyable, feelings of contribution, losing track of time, being in the moment, and also providing a sensory experience. And the heart was about attunement. So this tuning in and this emotional effective kind of learning and open mindedness and even ecological mindfulness, taking those moments to slow down, to really tune in to nature. So just to wrap up, I've only got 10 seconds, but I'll just give myself an extra minute. Uh, shifting practices again, my role at Arthur Isla Institute, which I'm really excited to be a part of um, the team that I'm working with. And my work comes under the DALP policy, protecting Victoria's environment, biodiversity 2037. And those goals, many of you know, are Victoria's natural environment is healthy and Victorians value nature. And so as you can see, a lot of my work filters quite well into these types of um, goals and, and purposes that we're working towards. So some of the projects I'm working on are connecting communities. And one of the events coming up is called Our Stories of Nature Recovery. And this will be in East Gippsland and it's a community focused biodiversity forum. So I'm really excited about working with the Gippsland team in delivering that. I'm also looking at working with supporting collaboration of citizen science projects across Victoria. And I'm really excited to be helping Rich Faulkner in um, delivering and planning for the Victorian Nature Festival in 2021 this year. So I'll leave you with a quote. Uh, Art is not a mirror held up to reality, but a hammer with which to shape it. So we don't know what shape of that hammer is. Maybe it's a sledgehammer, maybe it's a little geology pick. I don't know, it might be up to us. Um, but I really do feel that art has a really fantastic role um, to play in the way that we can get uh, more Victorians to value nature. So I'll leave it on my summary slide. And if there are any questions, I'm happy to answer them. So thank you. Thank you, Christina. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure there are many other people applauding around the place. So thank you so much. That was really terrific. Um, I'm fascinated by this kind of work and I, and I love to hear about what you've done in the past. And of course, I'm excited about what you're doing with us now. And and I'm hoping that that hammer is a yes, nice <laughs> little one. Yeah. <laughs> um, we do have a couple of questions here. I'm going to ask Andy to lead us through them. Andy, would you like to um, bring us some of these questions while I have a look at what's there as well. Yeah, no worries. Um, the first one is whether these sessions are being recorded. I'm just going to say yes, they are. They'll be up on the ARI website later this week. And for any of the other recordings of ARI seminars, you can visit the website and find all of those. Um, first question for you, Christina, is from mm -hmm. Vera, and she thanks you for your enthusiasm and experience and sharing it with you, us today. Do you feel that during 2020, more Victorians and particularly Melbournians took the opportunity to connect with nature? And if so, how might we use this opportunity as a program and policy implementers? Oh, wow. Um, yeah, well, I, I think so. I mean, um, anecdotally, but also there's, a, there's some research coming out now of um, people finding nature because pretty much had nothing else to do. And on our, well, particularly Melbourne, I guess, we had one hour to get out. And a lot of those times we would want to be outdoors and being some, you know, whether it was bird watching. I know that um, uh, citizen science and bird watching went up over 50 percent. I think it was. I can't remember the exact numbers, but went up quite significantly. Um, so 
Yes, I do think more people connected um, with nature and started to really appreciate local nature. So rather than feeling like we had to get to national parks or our bushwalks and things like that, um, finding little pockets within the urban matrix, I think, was something that probably people did a lot of. I, I found I did that. I looked in my 5K radius. I'm like, oh, my gosh, where are the green bits? Where can I go? Um, so, yes, definitely. Um, and the second part of the question was about um, policy. I think so. Um, I think, yeah, encouraging people to really keep that contact contact with uh, local nature. So whether that's getting involved with local citizen science projects that maybe local government are running um, or their schools are running as well, I think it would be really great to tap into um, schools and local government because that really brings us to that local place based nature connection and citizen science. So. Yeah, I don't know if that completely answers the question about policy, but that was my best shot, <laughs> being quite a newbie, but yeah. I liked it. You did well. <laughs> um, next question is from Jo, and she was asking around the workshop participants and how they knew about the event. And yeah. do you think there was a it was a biased audience in that they were already attending this nature event uh, and already had that interest in nature and the environment already? Yes, yes and yes. So um, I'll do the first question. So. Um, as part of the Living Pavilion, there were several websites set up um, within the Clean Air Urban Landscape Hub. They were the main, uh, one of the main drivers of the event. Um, so on that website, you could click through to book for any of the different workshops that were being advertised. Uh, it was also advertised through social media. Um, and so most people uh, booked in through an Eventbrite page that was set up for the workshops and um, there were some others as well that sort of just walked through and just randomly came to the workshop as well. Um, so I welcomed anyone and everyone at the time. Um, so that was how we sort of advertised and, and booked people in. And yes, I didn't recognise it in the talk, but um, yes, there would have been a bias towards people that already had a somewhat interested view in nature. Um, but some participants came because it said art science, they said, Normally I wouldn't go to a science talk, but because it was an art component, I felt like it felt more accessible to me. So um, I felt that was an interesting sort of comment. Um, but yes, I do recognise that there would have been uh, people that chose to go there because they had a pre pre interest in art and science or something nature related. But not all of them were. Yeah, there was still a mixed bag of, of people, I think, to to capture their experience. Thanks, Christina. Um, there's heaps of really good questions, so I've only got time for a couple more, but um, mm -hmm. hopefully some of them are answered by Lily's presentation next. Um, this current one is, do you think people living rurally would have different ways of connecting and acting for nature? Uh, that's a really interesting question and it'd be a great research. <laughs> Uh, research question. Probably, yes. Um, I guess we're, if you look at it from a place-based place perspective, people in urban areas are a little bit more potentially restricted in what type of nature we can connect with um, or get access to. I think access is a, is a big sort of issue um, for, for a lot of urbanites. Um, and I guess from for rural people, um, perhaps it's slightly different types of nature. It's more open, open fields and vistas um, and large old trees and, and those sorts of elements of nature that we can connect to. Um, rather within the urban world, you know, I try and get people to look for the small things like insects, I think are a great way to really tune people in um, to urban nature because um, it's a way to focus in and and, and find those moments uh, of nature connection. But whereas at, uh, maybe in regional areas, it might be, you know, looking for birds and koalas and, and kangaroos and things like that. Um, so there's potentially difference, um, but that would be a really great question to ask in terms of personal experience, I think. Yeah. All right. Final question before we. Oh, oh like, Andy. Oh, okay. Don't have to go. We'll get, yeah. We'll get him to <laughs> I think we might move on if that's okay. Yeah. Um, just noting, as Andy said, there is a bunch of really good questions in there, Christina. Mm -hmm. And um, as we have sometimes done in the past, it would be terrific um, if after this you have a chance to look through, through those and we answer some of those in our follow-up email to our um, seminar subscribers. 
because there's loads of stuff there that I think lots of people would love to hear about. There's some really good questions. Yeah. But I, I want to make sure that Lily has plenty of time as well. Yes, so I know. Much, we could spend all day talking about this, but um, <laughs> we'll now um, now jump to Lily Van Eden, who um, ha also has a really terrific history prior to coming to us at ARI. We're thrilled to have her with us as a postdoc, and she's going to talk with you about exploring human attitudes and behaviours to improve conservation outcomes. Thanks so much, Lily. Over to you. Thank you, Fern. I'd first like to start by saying that I'm presenting from Bunwarang country and acknowledge their elders past, present and emerging. Um, I've, I'm a postdoc at ARI. I'm also affiliated with Icon Science at RMIT and Behaviour Works at Monash University. And today I'd like to run through a few examples of projects I've been working on in the last few years that broadly look at uh, understanding attitudes and behaviours related to conservation. A bit of an overview of what I want to talk about today. Um, first of all, uh, understanding the drivers of behaviours in order to develop interventions and understand how we can influence our target audience. And then also exploring public attitudes, recognising that attitudes can be a predictor of behaviour and that can be relevant in terms of supporting wildlife management programs that we may have. And then finally, to talk a little bit about the direction I'm taking with my uh, the rest of my postdoc at ARI. The first thing I'd like to talk about has been the centre of my PhD research at the University of Sydney, and that is looking at conflict between dingoes and livestock production. Dingoes are a really great example of a controversial, charismatic species where just about every aspect of, of their um, existence is debated. Either should they be regarded as native or non-native? Uh, what should their taxonomy be? How do they differ from a domestic dog? Uh, one part of that is um, academic debate about their role in ecosystems, with some academic ecologists arguing that they have a positive role in, in suppressing uh, large native herbivores and possibly introduce mesopredators. Other people saying th that they that may not be the case and instead they're, they're impacting on threatened species. Um, so we don't have a resolution on that, but they're, they're, um, because dingoes are regarded in some legislation as a native species, they're, they're protected in some areas, for example, under the Flora and Fauna, Fauna Guarantee Act in Victoria. But at the same time, since, uh, since European colonisation in Australia, dingoes pretty quickly realised that sheep are easier targets than large herbivores, native, herb uh, sorry, native herbivores like kangaroos and emus. And so they can cause real harm to the livestock production industry. And so um, the estimates of the impacts financially, in, including uh, the costs and the losses associated with the tax, uh, the, with the attacks, but also um, the costs of, of mitigating these attacks are estimated at up to $89 million a year. So there are places in Australia where they're regarded as, as a valued species and, and we may want to affect uh, landowners' behaviours to protect them in those places. And then, of course, there are, there are places where they are considered to be less desirable and they're um, a declared pest and there's an obligation for landowners to control them. So we might want to understand how to influence the, uh, landowners' behaviour. I conducted a survey as part of my PhD of, of graziers across Australia, and I included questions that uh, related to four key possible predictors of, of behaviour in terms of whether people engage in, the, in lethal or non-lethal management. One of those was perception of risk, how, how likely do people think an attack is and how worried that they are about that, and that was tied very much with the kinds of livestock they produce, sheep being much more um, susceptible to attack than cows. Uh, values relevant to wildlife conservation. So do they perceive of wildlife as having intrinsic value or do they hold more utilitarian views? Attitudes towards dingoes in particular and also social identity. So how people viewed themselves within society and how they um, saw themselves as, as fitting in with like-minded people and how that influenced their, their views on things and their behaviours and things like that. And I found that all of these were uh, significant predictors of whether somebody engaged in lethal control or not. Uh, but when I put all of them into a model together, the only one that came out as significant was social identity. And so whether somebody viewed themselves as an environmentalist, they were less likely to use lethal control of dingoes or, or, or wild dogs. And people who viewed themselves as a pest controller were more likely to engage in lethal management. And it's probably because social identity encompasses and explains some of these other things. It's tied with people's values. Um, social identity proposes that, that people view themselves as being part of a group with like-minded views and that 
in turn also affects how they, they, they view particular issues. And I think one important aspect of that is recognising that if we want to influence behaviour, we, we don't want to just be talking about risk because that's not the only thing that, and perhaps not the most powerful thing that, that's going to influence people's behaviour. We need to understand their broader um, perception of themselves and the values that they hold. And this um, dingoes being relevant to, to people's identity isn't just a unique uh, moment in time. This is something that's been happening for the last 200 years. Um, dingoes have been in conflict with livestock production. This became really apparent, especially in, in the 1950s, just after World War II, when, when um, wool exports were about 20% of, of Australia's GDP. Australia was seen to be riding on the back of the sheep. And Australia saw this as a time when they well, when we established ourselves as a, as a nation independent of, of our British ancestry. So that wool production is a real part of, of the historic um, Australian post-colonial or colonial identity, I guess. And so dingoes being seen as one as the number one enemy to that, um, there's, there is a real strong, broader cultural context in which views on dingoes are, are determined. I think it's really important to think about history in thinking about how we make decisions and judgments and our priorities in conservation and wildlife management. And as part of my um, PhD, I spent uh, some time as a Fulbright scholar at the University of Washington in the USA. And I, I got to, that got me thinking while I was exposed to the culture of, of wildlife management and conservation in the US about how our culture and our practices in, in Australia have evolved. So in the USA, they talk about having the North American model of wildlife, ma wildlife management, which basically means there's been a really heavy emphasis there on management of game species. So things that hunters value, things like deer. And that's also probably a consequence of the fact that a lot of money is generated through hunting in the USA. Hunting is a really big part of, of, of culture in, in rural areas in, in various parts of the USA. And so people buy hunting tags and there's a portion of, of um, ammunition sales that go towards government wildlife agencies. So there's a real great resource from a financial perspective there, but that money is also thought to have, um, the way in it, that it's been spent is thought to, to be biased towards certain kinds of management, those ones that are regarded as game and valuable to hunters. Meanwhile, in Australia, I'm sure I don't have to tell my audience that hunting isn't as big a culture in Australia as it is in the USA, and it doesn't contribute very much funding um, to, to Australian wildlife management. So there isn't, we don't have as much money available to wildlife management as, as there is in the USA, but also the focus of our management is quite different. And that's made me think about um, the geographic context in that the USA is, it has Canada on the north, Man uh, Mexico to the south, and then Central and South America. So there's this connection geographically there uh, for flow and movement of species, whereas Australia has been isolated geographically for a really long time, meaning that we've evolved really unique flora and fauna that hasn't coped very well with the arrival of introduced species. And that's meant that the suppression of invasive species and management of the risks they pose to, to native species has been a major focus of Australia's conservation, more so than, than other parts in the world, other than comparable nations like New Zealand. So I was interested to, to think more on this. Um, so that's that's a bit of context in terms of what we do and the and how we got to where we are today. But how is that reflected perhaps in public perspectives on management? And one thing I did as part of my PhD research was distribute a nationwide survey in Australia, um, surveying the general public. And some of the questions I put in there, I developed in partnership with some colleagues at Ohio State University. And we both distributed um, surveys. So mine was in Australia, theirs was in the USA, looking at perspectives on wildlife management, uh, methods used and justification for man management. And we were able to compare between the Australian and USA publics. Basically, we found that Australians were generally more accepting of um, of lethal wildlife and pest management. Uh, Australians were more likely to think it's acceptable to kill native predators that attack livestock, oh, sorry, more likely to think that it's acceptable to kill native predators that, that attack endangered na uh, native species, more likely to think that wildlife control is acceptable if, it's, if, it is the, um, if wildlife is the cause of economic loss. But the one that was the biggest difference was that uh, Australians are more likely to think that the careful use of poison is an acceptable method to control wildlife populations. 
And that one I thought was really interesting because there are a few reasons why that might be. One of them is just a reflection of what we do. So in the USA, poison use in wildlife management has been largely banned since the 1970s. It's only used in very restricted contexts. Whereas in Australia, it's it's fairly widespread and it's um, used primarily to manage introduced species. So foxes and cats and, and um, feral dogs and things like that. Um, so I thought it was interesting to think about uh, that context and forming public attitudes, but I also wanted to dig a bit deeper in understanding how how the public view their perspectives of, on of, how the public public form perspectives on wildlife management in Australia. So as I said, I conducted a nationwide survey intended to be representative of the Australian public. And I wanted to um, get people's perspectives on the management of four charismatic uh, mammals in Australia, kangaroos, dingoes and then horses and red foxes and I wanted to do that because uh, we know that public attitudes can lead to public behaviours that can derail uh, wildlife and pest management programs through protest and also because a lot of that management is taxpayer funded so it's important for us to, to understand how our conservation objectives align with public values and priorities. So first of all, I wanted to ask that question around um, Australia's history of managing non-native species. And I asked people whether they considered these four charismatic mammals to be native. Most people, unsurprisingly, just about everyone agreed kangaroos were native. Um, almost 85% of people said dingoes were natives. And then about one in five considered horses and foxes were native. And I was really interested in this finding that seemed quite high to me and reflected that uh, although as um, people working in conservation, we might have a fairly set idea of nativeness and non-native, it is ultimately um, a label that we've developed and, and not everybody ascribes to those same definitions. The other thing I wanted to do was link those perceptions of nativeness versus non-nativeness with people's support for lethal control. So this figure shows uh, support for lethal management of each of these um, groups of species. Uh, with positive values indicating support for lethal control and negative values indic indicating opposition. And I've compared people's, uh, people who viewed each one as native compared with people who viewed them as non-native. And you can see that there is much stronger opposition to lethal control among people who consider each of those groups of animals to be, uh, to be native. So it's almost as though non-nativeness is seen as justification for lethal control. One other thing I looked at in this survey was uh, social identity as a predictor. And again, I found whether people identified as an environmentalist, an animal welfare advocate, um, a farmer, those were all uh, meaningful predictors of people's support for, for lethal, lethal and non-lethal management. I won't go into the details of that part of the study, but just wanted to use that as a segue to uh, another study that I was working in again while I was in the USA. Um, I was based in Seattle in Washington state and we conducted a statewide survey of the Washington public to get an idea of their uh, support for wolf conservation in Washington state. So wolves were eradicated about 100 years ago, 100 years ago in Washington and have since been returning naturally through um, crossing the border from Canada and from surrounding states. And we included the common demographic predictors that we knew from previous literature are good predictors of, of support for predator management like gender and age and um, level of education, urban versus rural location. And that those sorts of things followed the kinds of trends that we were expecting. But what was really novel with this study was that we found above all of those predictors, the strongest predictor of people's support for wolf conservation was who, which political party they identified with. So basically, um, Democrats were far more likely to support wolf conservation than other voter types, although we didn't see the reverse. For example, we didn't see Republicans being anti-wolf. But it really, for me, hit home this um, component of the study that as an animal like the wolf, which gets a lot of media atten attention in the USA and is really in, in the public eye, is really seen to be broader, the conflict is seen to be broader than just the conflict between wolves and ranchers. They're seen to be symbolic of, of broader social, social and ideological conflict. So we can see um, voting affiliation as a kind of ideological identity. Um, and so wolves are seen as being representative of uh, conflict over whether ranchers should be allowed to graze on public land, um, gun rights, uh, wise use compared with non-consumptive uses of wildlife like uh, wildlife viewing and photography and hiking and things like that. So there's there's a lot more 
involved in this than just a conflict about the animal itself. As part of this same study, we, we were thinking, well, if there's general support for, for wolf conservation across Washington state with a variation in the levels of support, obviously, uh, between different demographic groups, uh, what can we take from this? Can we find a way to, to harness this uh, public support for wolf conservation and do something useful with it? At the moment, uh, the state government uh, runs a program that facilitates coexistence between wolves and livestock producers. So um, uh, essentially, so wolves are protected in the state and there are restrictions on, on the use of lethal control. Uh, basically, you can't just go out and shoot a wolf. Um, and so ranchers are supported financially and through provision of training and resources to help them protect their livestock in other ways. But as wolves continue to recover, as they are doing currently, it probably will get to a point where they no longer need to be protected and there'll be an easing of, of um, the restrictions on lethal control, but also uh, less money available to continue running such a program. So we included in our survey questions to ask, to gauge people's support for the idea of introducing a few mechanisms for collecting public funds through donation and taxes on certain kinds of, of uses uh, such as um, visitation to national parks or taxes on outdoor hiking equipment, things like that, and even um, certification of wolf-friendly livestock product, uh, products that could be sold at a premium in supermarkets. And we found there, there was support for some of these things. Um, but we also include, included a choice experiment to get an estimate of the financial, perceived financial value of, of wolves for the Washington public. And we found that uh, based on our survey, the public, an individual Washington resident on average was willing to pay $80 per year to support such a program. And that resulted in, that basically equates to about 240 million per year if every household contributed that $80. That's more than 150 times what's currently spent on the state funded project. And of course, we don't expect that people will put their money with where their mouth is and actually spend $80 per year per household. But even if we just captured a very small percentage of that, it does seem that there's potential to, to harness this public support for, for wolf conservation and continue a project that will allow wolves and ranchers to coexist together. The last uh, project I want to quickly talk about is, uh, is a component of the VEVN project. So this is new data that we've just received in January. Um, cat containment is, a tar is one of the Victorians value nature target behaviours, one of five. And so it's something that we're interested in promoting people to do, um, keep their cats from freely roaming and impacting on wildlife. And for us as conservationists, that message that keeping a cat indoor will protect wildlife might seem sufficient to get people to actually do it. And so we wanted to explore that. And we did so using um, the third annual uh, Victorians Value Nature statewide survey, which we got just over a thousand respondents, 220 of which have cats. And we found that just over half keep their cats contained 24 hours a day, meaning either that their cat lives inside or that they have a cat run or a backyard or courtyard that they can't leave from or they're on a leash or supervised. Um, we found that about a third of respondents kept their cats only confined at night, but they could roam sometimes during the day. And 17% uh, place no restrictions on the movement of their cats during the day or night or limited restrictions. We also looked at the kinds of things that predicted cat behaviour, uh, cat containment behaviour, and we found that it wasn't concern about wildlife. That wasn't a significant predictor at all. Um, actually, the, the things that did predict whether or not people kept their cats contained were their concern for their cats, which is perhaps unsurprising. So people kept their cats contained if they were concerned about uh, their cat being hit by a car or attacked by a dog or being exposed to diseases or running away and getting lost, things like that. And also people who were concerned for kind of cat freedoms, believing that cats have the right to roam and hunting is a normal and natural behaviour. So understanding these, uh, these motivations might help us to think about appropriate messaging and who are the appropriate messengers to encourage people to contain their cats. And these sorts of things are being reflected in current work done by Zoos Victoria and the RSPCA in, in pushing this kind of cat welfare um, dimension of, of keeping cats contained. Interestingly, though, one thing we did find was that people who didn't contain their cat were more likely to think that their cat wasn't much of a hunter. So there may be an element of um, 
the wildlife uh, component in, in an education campaign here where we help people to understand that they just may not be fully aware of the risks that their cats pose to wildlife in that a lot of cats don't bring home what they hunt. And just finally, where I'm planning to go next, uh, so that last part on cats was part of the Victorians Value Nature program. There are four other target behavioural groups that v the VVN program is targeting. But broadly, the big picture question for me is that we know from these surveys that we've done that Victorians do value nature, but how can we move people from valuing nature to doing something that benefits biodiversity? And so I'm interested in these five groups, but also more broadly understanding that how can we perhaps cause uh, acting for biodiversity and valuing biodiversity to become part of the Victorian identity? How can we make it the norm? And so people engaging in these behaviours that benefit biodiversity has a direct impact on, on biodiversity benefits, but also does it create this kind of bigger groundswell and recognition of, of how Victorians value nature in terms of what we focus on for our, prior, for our policy priorities. And lastly, uh, I know Fern acknowledged at the beginning that um, this sort of social sciences dimension of ARI is, is relatively new for an organisation that's primarily focused on ecological research. So I hope that my research has, my presentation today has, has given a bit of an insight into why understanding attitudes and behaviours can be interesting and important to understanding how to find conservation solutions. Thank you. Wow, 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 wow. <laughs> this is so weird, isn't it? I can hear somebody else <laughs> clapping. Great. Thanks, Christina. <laughs> Thank you, Lily. That was um, just terrific. And um, yeah, huge welcome to both of you coming for ARI and bringing this kind of work to complement our ecological work. Um, totally true that it is important and very much interesting. Now my, um, my Q&A thing has just got a circle thing going around. It's not refreshing. So um, I'm hoping that Andy might have a question or two lined up there. We don't have much time, but we do have about three or four minutes. So Andy, is yours refreshing? Do we have some questions there for Lily? I can't see. I really hope it is refreshing. Um, I've only got a couple questions, so people send them in. Otherwise, I am going to have to make sure it is refreshing. But the first question um, that I've got for you is, what are the challenges of extending this research to conservation or to considering forestry and wildlife conservation? I believe this might be around the wolf attitudes and maybe some of the political ideologies. Oh, I think that's a really interesting question. I have very limited background in understanding the, the context of forestry and, and especially the Victorian context. So despite growing up in Victoria, I've only moved back in December. So I feel like I'm a bit disconnected from the forestry context here. But I do think it's a really interesting one. And I guess a big part of why uh, I found the US comparison with Australia really relevant is because there is this kind of similar urban versus rural values reflecting a kind of left versus right in terms of understanding different people, how people's attitudes are formed to, to a program. So I think you can you could ask some similar questions that would kind of help to develop how people form their attitudes driven by their different kinds of values. It's not just uh, environmental values that might be values more relevant to their broader ideological perspectives, I guess. So I think that's a very vague answer, but it really is because I don't I don't know enough about the context with forestry. Sorry. <laughs> well done. No, that's good. Um, this question is quite relevant to, I think, current work. Um, has the VVN cat containment research been published? Is it possible to get a copy? Uh, well, I, I'm I'm happy to share a very early draft with the person that asked that question. I've actually just sent the first version of the draft round to the other co-authors for feedback. So it's 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 in process, but we just got the data back mid-January. So it's definitely not published yet, <laughs> but that's where we're aiming for it to end up. <laughs> Thanks for the update. Um, this person's asking, how much do you think we should allow community attitudes towards pest species and lethal control influence government policy and programs around invasive species. Yeah, and, and I mean, that one can, is obviously, you can think of some really good examples of, of those issues, like, you know, horses, for example. Um, I guess 
part of it is, I think, important for exploring how those differences of opinions are informed, so that we are formed, so we know how to communicate with those people and, and respond to, to a diversity of attitudes. And I, I also think we do as a public service have a responsibility to voters, but at the same time, we have to have an understanding of, of what those opinions are. And, and I don't know the stats off the top of my head, but for, an ex for example, something like um, horse management, um, what is the broad public sentiment? Is there just a few loud squeaky wheels or what, what does the broader public care about in terms of the management priorities there? Uh, I mean, I saw from my survey with uh, attitudes towards roo management, yes, we see public backlash against roo control, especially in urban areas, but, but we also, I mean, in my survey, I found that generally people didn't view lethal roo control all that negatively. So I think as I said in the uh, comparison of Australian and US um, attitudes towards wildlife management, Australians actually are quite supportive of lethal management. And I think just understanding what influences people's decisions in forming those attitudes is important for knowing how we should communicate about, about how to effectively um, implement that management and why it's being done. Mm. No, that's really good. Thanks, Lee, for that perspective. Um, another question. So a lot of your research you spoke about were around um, mammals. Any chance you're looking in, into anything for invasive garden plants and weeds? I'm not personally. Um, and it was only because my PhD centred around dingoes and I just compared dingoes with a few other charismatic mammals that we knew about public attitudes towards. Um, so I don't know. I, I'm sure there are people looking at those attitudes. Uh, I know there are a few teams looking at um, attitudes towards native and non-native species in urban areas, but I, I'm not up to date with that research. Cool. Um, Fern, do we have time for one more question? Mm, well, it's two o'clock. Uh, is it a simple question? <laughs> Are uh, there any simple no, questions a, a, in this field of work? Question, no. <laughs> That's it. We'll, we'll maybe leave it for Lily to answer offline. But. Okay, Let, let's leave it then because um, there are so many questions that we have and I think the questions that really helped us realise that this is an area that is rich in opportunity of things to explore. There are so many things that we could explore in this area. And one of the things that was also highlighted for me through the questions and through Lily's talk was that we can't look at um, data or findings from other countries and directly transpose them here. We do need to understand what's happening in the Victorian context and what works for us here in Victoria. And we're really thrilled to have your capability here to help us with that, Lily, and also Christina. So I am going to close it here, mindful of people probably have other things to go to, but I'd like to say thank you to you both. Fantastic to have you here. Thank you so much for your presentations. Um, we will email out links to the recordings and my, my sincere apologies. I totally forgot to advise people at the start that we were recording, but I hope that was okay with people. Um, and please jump in and subscribe if you um, not already subscribed to our seminars so you can hear about the next one. But thanks so much to everybody for coming along. Thanks to Andy for all the tech. Thanks to Christina and Lily. And please, everyone, please try and come along to our next seminar. Uh, look out for advice on that on the website or through your email or Twitter from us. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. See ya. Thank you. Bye. Bye.